Hello, everyone. Welcome to another HAA Expert Exchange, where we address real questions with expert answers. My name is Morgan Taylor, the editor of Abode Magazine at HAA, and I'm your moderator with our host, Gina Irwin of GWR Management. Today is Tuesday, August 18th, and today's topic is on talking residents through HVAC issues. Before we turn it over to Gina, I'm gonna review some housekeeping items. For our viewers today, please ask any questions you may have in the Zoom chat box or in the comments via Facebook Live. Once we get through the questions we curated, we will get to your questions. This is a micro webinar, so we're gonna to try to keep the session to our 30 minute time window. But if you do have any follow-up questions, please don't hesitate to email us at com at haaonline.org. A disclaimer before we get started, we are not public health experts nor attorneys. This webinar is provided for general information purposes only and does not constitute legal or professional advice. No HAA member should act on the basis of any material contained in the webinar without obtaining proper legal or other professional advice specific to their situation. Please consult with your management company or property owner to address specific issues and to form your own company guidelines. With that, I'll turn it over to our host, Gina. Thank you, Morgan, as always. I appreciate you. Hi, everyone. My name is Gina Irwin. I am with GWR Management. Today, we are talking with Michelle Bridges from Century AC Supply, and we are going to be talking specifically about uh, working residents through air conditioning issues. Um, I'm going to read Mich Michelle's bio real quickly because it's a good one. Um, Michelle Bridges is the Vice President of Multifamily at Century Air Conditioning Supply. She has over 22 years of experience working for Century Air Conditioning. She serves on both the HAA and TAA Board of Directors. She's also a winner of the prestigious Olin Steel Lifetime Achievement Award. Century AC Supply is a Houston-based wholesale distributor of HVAC equipment and supplies. Founded in 1973 by Dennis Bearden, Century Air Conditioning Supply is a privately owned company serving the multifamily industry, residential and commercial air conditioning contractors, schools, government entities, and industrial companies throughout the state of Texas. Michelle, welcome. We're so glad to have you. Thank you very much, Gina. I'm very happy to be here today. Good. Well, I mean, let's, let's move right into it. I mean, obviously, you know, it's Houston, it's hot, and AC is, is a big issue, and it's not something that can be ignored. Um, given the environment and that we're limited going into residence apartments, I think a lot of people have shifted to sort of emergency maintenance only. AC obviously qualifies when it's 100 outside. Um, how, how can we address this as an industry, given the sort of self-imposed restrictions we've done? Wow, great question, Gina. You're right, when it's hot, and it has been hot all this week, there's a lot of things that we can do to help keep maintenance staff out of units if possible, and to help them be as efficient as possible. With just a little bit of help from the office staff, we can ask residents to do some just kind of basic troubleshooting over the phone to help solve some of their air conditioning problems. That kind of gives maintenance a hand up whenever it's time for them to get in there. Perfect. So AC requests come in. What sort of questions are we supposed to be asking people? Well, you know, the first thing that you want to do is you want to make sure that the thermostat is set properly. So when you're looking at the thermostat, you want to make sure that it's set to the cool position. Um, that may sound pretty self-explanatory, but a lot of times it gets shifted to off or maybe even to heat. So we want to make sure that it's set in the cool position. We also want to make sure that the fan is set to on. You can set it in the auto position and that's a great position to save energy. But if we want to see if the air conditioner is working properly, we do want to go ahead and make sure that that is set to on. In addition to that, we want to make sure that it is set to a temperature that is cooler than what it actually is in the room. If it's warmer or equal to the room temperature, the thermostat will think that it's done its job and satisfied and it won't call for cooling. And then we do wanna make sure that we give the, the air conditioner an adequate time to respond. So we need to make sure that the thermostat has been set this way for at least 20 minutes because if it's gotten warm and humid in an apartment, the first thing that the air conditioner will do is remove the humidity 
which will take it a little bit longer to bring down the temperature. So it might take a few minutes to actually see that, even though the air conditioner is performing as it should be. Okay, come on. Do really people accidentally get it set to heat in, in August in Houston? <laughs> I mean, you would be surprised. Like, Ask your maintenance folks. They will tell you some stories. They will tell you some stories. I yes, can, but that's I one of their imagine. favorite fixes, right? They get to come in and be the hero. Let's just set it to cool. Problem solved. It's a great day for everyone. Okay, perfect. So I get it. You know, uh, most people don't have the, the simple knowledge that we might have um, having served this industry for so long. So, so you walk someone through all of that. You walk someone through the thermostat. You walk them through the settings, make sure it's right. What if that doesn't work? Then what? If the thermostat's set properly, the next biggest villain that's the easiest to solve is checking out that AC filter. If the filter has gotten dirty, and sometimes they can get pretty dirty, especially for home a lot more these days than we're accustomed to being home. It might be an unusual case. If that filter gets dirty, it absolutely makes it harder for the air conditioner to breathe, so to speak. We starve the air conditioner of the incoming air. So we do want to make sure that that AC filter is nice and clean. Okay, and, and this next question, uh, I, already, I want to go on record and say I already know the answer to it, but I'm going to ask it anyway. <laughs> um, so the AC filters, and, and we do tend to forget kind of the simple things. Are you set to cool? Or, you know, is your AC filter clean? But is the, is the filter really that, that critical to think the amount of cooling that can take place in an apartment? Absolutely. That really is the place where all the air comes in. And if the air conditioner is not getting an adequate amount of air, it really cannot perform properly. It needs to have an adequate amount moving through the coils. And one of the things that residents probably also need to make sure is that they don't have a filter that has too high a MERV factor, MERV. Um, what that does is it's much harder for the air conditioner to pull air through, and that kind of does the same thing kind of starves the air conditioner a little bit. Now, properties tend to do a fabulous job of having the right MERV. It's kind of when the residents decide that they're going to do their own filters, that this might be a concern. Okay, that makes sense. All right, so these are great steps, great questions that we're going to ask people before we enter. Let's say we've walked through all of this and it's, we're, it's still not working properly and we can't get it resolved. What else can residents do before we actually have to come into their apartments? Fabulous. You know, the next thing that we want to know is how is the inside part of the air conditioner performing? So we want to know, is there air coming out of the vents? We wanna see how that blower motor inside is doing. So what you wanna do is ask the resident to see if there is air coming out of an event, of a vent that's close to, but not right at the filter. So literally they should just reach their hand up, put it in front of the vent, double check that the vent is not closed because most vents have an adjustable slide that will close the vent. So they need to double check that it is not closed and see if there's air coming out of that vent. Got it. Makes sense. Okay. So next, all of this troubleshooting, we're walking people through this. What if none of this works? Then what? You know, if we can't, uh, if we can't get the thermostat set right, make sure that the filter is clean, if all of those things don't solve the problem, well then your inside staff, your office staff wants to make sure that they're taking some pretty good notes for maintenance staff. That way then maintenance can kind of pick up the ball here and see what's going on and what might be, a, what might be wrong with the air conditioner. The better notes that we have from the inside staff, the, the easier it is for maintenance to kind of know what they're facing if it is, if they do have to go inside of an occupied residence. That's, that's helpful. Uh, yeah, communication's key. And I think our maintenance staff would probably appreciate that kind of communication on all of our work orders, maybe not just focused only on AC. But given the environment, because we're trying to be mindful about going into people's apartments and they're fearful about us being there. So we have to enter at this point, or do we? Well, you know, what I would, um, what I would suggest is a lot like when you have a medical visit, it's not unlike, it's not unusual for the nurse and the doctor to ask you the same questions. I would suggest that maintenance staff go ahead and make contact with the residents as well and ask kind of the same series of questions um, for a couple of reasons. I don't think it hurts to go over the same questions. 
and also maintenance because they have a deeper skill level might see some things that maybe an office person wouldn't and again that would help maintenance when they're ready to go should they need to to go into the apartment to be better prepared and and to have their tools ready and you know, know what they're looking at know what their diagnosis is uh, so the maintenance folks, do they have to go inside at this point? Can they check the outside first? I mean, what sort of steps or protocols should they or can they take? Leave Absolutely. Inside. There's a the number resort. of things. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to talk over you. That's okay. Absolutely. There's a number of things that they can check in the air conditioner that are actually outside. Air conditioning systems are made up of kind of two different components. There's the electrical component which is both inside and outside, but then there's the mechanical component, which is accessed and repaired pretty much just outside. Although in normal times, we're very accustomed to troubleshooting both inside and outside of a residence. In our special circumstances, there's an awful lot we can learn and repair without ever going inside. Pretty much everything inside the refrigerant loop is repairable and things that would apply to things like an overcharge, an undercharge, a leak, a restriction, contaminated refrigerant, um, a weak compressor. There's a number of things that we might be able to determine and repair without ever going inside of a residence. That makes sense. So probably a good idea to, to not only have the office staff talk to the resident, but have the maintenance guys have those conversations as well. That's a great suggestion. Thank you. Um, so let's shift a little bit and talk kind of specifically about COVID, COVID versus air conditioning. I mean, I know you're not a doctor and I know you're not going to speak in those terms, but truthfully, can, can it spread through the AC system? Are there stops and placers or something, you know, much like allergens? I know there's things that you can buy to prevent allergies or minimize those. Right. No, excellent question, Dina. And, and you're right. I'm not a doctor. I'm not an attorney. Um, I'm just here to talk a little bit about air conditioning systems. <clears throat> and, and I think it's fairly intuitive um, that, that if there is a COVID virus in an environment and it's airborne, if there's not some sort of preventative measure in place, yes, the air conditioner can pull in the virus and distribute it through the vents. If there's not something there to inhibit it, the virus would move freely with the air like the rest of the air in the, in the space would do. So let, let's dig into that. So what is an inhibitor exactly? And, and <laughs> what does that look like? And put that, put that in English for those of us that don't know what that <laughs> So with the, uh, with the virus, an inhibitor is something that would kill it, stop it from spreading, you know, diminish its effectiveness, any of those things. If, if anything that'll make it, make the virus less healthy and less infective. In air conditioning systems, there's, there's a number of things that kind of can be employed. Um, one of the things that we're seeing more and more of are highly dense filters. I, I alluded to them a little bit earlier, um, high MERV, M-E-R-V, which is the, the size particles that the filter catches. Um, we're seeing more of those sorts of things begin to be employed. Um, we're also seeing things like UV lights. UV lights have been uh, around for a very long time. This is how a lot of food is, is sterilized. Um, it's how aquariums are kept clean. Hospitals, very long track record, very, very safe. Um, there's also air scrubbers, which air scrubbers are kind of um, set apart things that would draw air in, denature the virus, and then send the air back out. And then there's also like our aerosols, our foggers, things like that. Those are kind of the, the four main things. And if you like, I'd be happy to kind of talk a little bit more about them, maybe some of their characteristics. So folks could maybe decide what might work for them, what might be better. Um, please do. But, and also I'd like you to clarify, I want to make sure that nobody gets the impression that we should be spraying Lysol into our air conditioning units. That's probably... <laughs> <laughs> um, no, ma'am, there are specific um, products that are made that I think you can find um, most everywhere for aerosols. And, and you need to read it. It'll say things like, you know, this is what it's designed for. Some of them are designed to be set like in the middle of the room and, and it, 
you know, brings that aerosol. With any sort of product, whether it's a UV light or whether it's an aerosol, it is critically important that we read the directions, we read them very carefully, and we follow them exactly. The folks that, that make these products and design these products absolutely know what they're doing, and we need to make sure that we're following their lead on this. Aerosols are probably the least expensive form, and, and I think they're fairly common now. There's a lot of different ones. Um, good ones frequently say that they're used in hospitals, and it'll say what viruses that they kill. And, and again, you want to read the directions and make sure that it works for your specific situation. The great thing about aerosols is it will kill things on surfaces. So if there happens to be, you know, a countertop or a table where maybe some virus has landed, an aerosol or a fogger absolutely will take that out. The kind of the downside of aerosols is a lot like hand sanitizers. Once the aerosol has, has dissipated and dried, the effectness, effectiveness is over. You know, it doesn't have any residual or continuing effect. It's very effective in the moment but when it's over, it's done. Um, as I said, UV lights are things that, that have been used for, to kill viruses for a very long time. They're in hospitals, um, aquariums, they, a lot of food service places use UV lights. They're more expensive than aerosols and they're more of a permanent solution. It's, you would put the UV light into the actual air conditioning system. The downside, in addition to it being more expensive, is that the air does have to move past the UV light. So if there was virus on a counter or a table, it's not effective for that. It would have to be airborne for the UV light to take it out. Air scrubbers are very similar. They don't have to be placed into the system, so it makes them a little bit more portable. And they could go, for instance, from the office to the gym, if that was something that you were interested in. They, um, they're separate, so they could be plugged in and used in different places. But like the UV light, the virus would have to be drawn into the air scrubber. It wouldn't kill virus on tables or countertops or things like that. Um, and then as we spoke about the, uh, the high MERV filters do work, and we're seeing a lot more of, of data come out about that. For our air conditioning systems, they're not designed, most of them are not designed to have a product that has that little breathability, you know, because the pores are very small to catch the viruses. So to use that on a permanent basis in our air conditioners frequently will cause problems. That's something that if you're going to use it permanently, you need to alter the, uh, the filter intake. You'll need to have a bigger place for the air to come in. You'll need to draw more air. Okay, well, that was super helpful. That was a great answer. And that was a lot of really, really good information. I appreciate that. And you've been so clear and articulate that we're actually a little bit early today. So I don't know, Morgan, if you have any questions that have come in either on Facebook or on our chat, but I'm gonna turn it back over to you for just a minute. All right, thanks, Gina. Yeah, thank you, um, Michelle. Great answers, very helpful. I don't have any questions in, our, in the chat on Zoom nor on Facebook. So if you guys have any questions, Go ahead and ask them now. Um, I'm going to quickly share um, my screen so that I can show you guys the a little slide that I think will be helpful. So right here is the is what you guys maybe if you want to take like a screenshot um, of this to then have on hand so that when you are um, asking those residents your uh, questions, you can then provide this to your maintenance tech and hopefully that will be a little bit easier for them. But like Michelle said, um, the maintenance tech should definitely re-ask all these questions that someone from the leasing um, office already asked, just like uh, Michelle described it as the the nurse and the doctor analogy. You know, you, you definitely want to ask those questions again. But this slide right here um, will help you kind of ask those questions and help guide your maintenance tech. And if you can't get a screenshot of it, I'd be happy to email it to anyone who wants it. 
Again, that email address would be calm at haaonline.org. Uh, okay, fantastic. Thank you, Mark Morgan, and thank you for sharing that. Um, I don't know if any question, I see a question that may have come in on the Q&A. Uh, I don't see it. Says are the questions office staff need to ask written anywhere. So um, if you'll put the, put that screenshot out there, that would probably be helpful. Okay, definitely. Yeah, that's the only thing I see. I don't see anything in the chat either. Um, well, fantastic. Michelle, thank you again. We really appreciate you joining us today. Um, super helpful information. Appreciate it very, very much. Um, so next week, next week is going to be our last expert exchange for the summer. So please tune in. We will pick back up in October uh, for sure. And in the meantime, if anyone has any topics or anything they'd be interested in seeing, please send that in to us as well because we're always looking for great ideas. Um, next week, join us please again Tuesday at the same time we are going to be talking about plumbing, which um, I don't know if that, not sure yet exactly the details, whether it's going to be about supplies or kind of similar to what we talked about troubleshooting with residents when they call. Um, but we will look forward to seeing you all next week. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Uh -huh.